uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, Wendy, I don't, I should have asked how you spell, pronounce your name, Wendy, but Wendy Cadge is a professor in the sociology department at Brandeis University. She is the author of Paging God, Religion in the Halls of Medicine, Heartwood, the first generation of Theravada Buddhism in America, and is a co-editor of Religion on the Edge, Decentering and Recentering the Sociology of Religion. Her exploration of Boston's hidden sacred spaces is a part of a broader project focused on chaplains in the greater Boston area historically and in the present. So Wendy contacted me um, last summer because she had heard about the Pedix Island Chapel, near and dear to so many people who see that chapel from Hull every day and um, wanted to get inside and, and photograph this space as a hidden gem in, in Boston. So please join me in welcoming Wendy. Thank you so much, thanks for having me. And a big thanks for allowing us to get inside the Pedix Island Chapel, that was the best part. So I brought you all some postcards tonight. If you want one, you're welcome to take one. Um, this is a project about chapels, meditation, and prayer rooms in greater Boston that are outside of congregations. So we know lots about the congregations through greater Boston, churches, mosques, synagogues. But what we thought we might do in this project is look at other places that are designated as spiritual or religious by people who use them. And this was sort of a, a wishy-washy designation because for some people, Fenway Park is spiritual, right? But we decided that for this project, we were only gonna focus on places that institutions themselves named as spiritual or religious. So we found more than 60 of these sites in Greater Boston. I'm gonna ask you when I'm finished which ones I've missed because we're still trying to add to our collection. We have them all up on our webpage, which is hiddensacredspaces.org, and I'll show you the website in a few minutes. But I thought what I could do in our time together is give you just a little tour of some of these places. Um, so I'm a sociologist. I'm interested in the history and the story of these spaces. Randall Armour may arrive here, I think probably not. He's the photographer, so he took all the pictures. And we worked also with an architectural historian named Alice Friedman at Wellesley College to figure out how to tell some of these stories. So I thought since we're gonna do a little tour here, we would start in a place where many people arrive when they're visiting Boston, which is at Logan Airport. Okay. So what you might not know is that Boston is actually unique in having the first airport chapel in the United States. It was built in 1951. It's called Our Lady of the Airways. And this is the sign that's outside today indicating where the chapel is. I had never seen the sign before I went looking for the chapel. So when I first heard about this chapel, I wondered why in the world does Boston or any city need an airport chapel? This just seemed like an interesting puzzle to me. And so I started to poke around and what I learned is that Catholic Archbishop Richard Cushing, who was the first Boston-born Archbishop in, uh, in Boston, opened this chapel in 1951 because he wanted a place for people who were working in the airport on long shifts to go to mass. So interestingly, this was not initially a chapel for travelers. It was a chapel for workers, many of whom actually were working 24-hour shifts. It was started as a Catholic chapel for, uh, for Catholics, and it really remains that way. I went to the archdiocese archives and went digging through their boxes, and I found a whole series of papers there that show that the space was also offered in the 1950s to Protestants and to Jews, but neither of those groups wanted to have an airport chapel. So this small circular Our Lady of the Airways Chapel opened to the public in 1951. This is a postcard that they gave out at the dedication. So this is what the chapel looked like uh, when it was first opened. The architects were Magnus Walsh and Kennedy, who worked at 126 Newbury Street in Boston. They actually did a lot of building for the archdiocese. And the archdiocese paid $100 in rent per year to the airport for a five-year lease so that they could build this chapel. A priest named Reverend Hawes at Our Lady of the Assumption Parish in East Boston held mass in the chapel, and he was the one who was first responsible for taking care of it. This chapel seated 165 people. It had a neon sign, apparently. I can't find a picture of the neon sign. But it had a neon sign, according to the document, so that people could find it. And I found some documents from 1957 that suggest that there were six masses in the chapel every Sunday. 
So this is a really bad picture of Archbishop Richard Cushing at the inauguration of the chapel. And this is the outside of the chapel today. So the original chapel in 1951 was actually moved because the airport was expanding. And in 1965, the current chapel, which is this one, was built where it still stands today. So if you walk from the outside, um, this is the door. Thank you. That's awesome. Oops. There, and if you peek in the door, uh, this is what the chapel looks like on the inside. Uh, there are several different priests who've been assigned to the airport as the chaplain, and some people in the 1970s and the 1980s were married there. Initially, some airline stewardesses and airline workers asked to be married there, and they are recorded in the sort of registries of Our Lady of the Assumption Parish um, nearby in East Boston. In the 1960s, I found an article in the Boston Globe that reported that they had to close the chapel in the evening because people were misbehaving in it. <laughs> According to the Globe, people were having sex in the chapel, yes. Um, and today, Mass actually continues to take place regularly in the chapel. The Catholic priest chaplain is available to meet with travelers and staff alike. And a small Muslim prayer rug was added to the back corner to make a space for Muslims to pray. Now, traditional Muslims will actually not pray. They're not comfortable praying in a place that has um, icons or any kind of imagery from other religious traditions. So an observant Muslim likely would not use this prayer space in the back, but the space is there. The thing that's interesting to know about this chapel is that Archbishop Cushing didn't stop at the airport. He actually wanted workers across the city to have chapels and places that they could pray. So he built a chapel in the port. And you may have heard a bit about this one last year. This is uh, Our Lady of Good Voyages. And this chapel was actually recently taken down as part of a development deal. You can see the buildings going up around it. And a new chapel was built. I can show you some of those pictures if you're interested. It was the first, this was uh, just last year, this was the first new Catholic church in Boston in quite a long time. <laughs> um, there also used to be a chapel in South Station. So this is the inside of the Port Chapel, the old one. And this is one of two pictures I could find of the old chapel in South Station. This chapel opened, I believe, in the late 1950s. I could check the details. There was a Catholic chap chaplain named Christopher Griffin who was responsible for this chapel. They actually, the archdiocese actually bought a former movie theater and converted the movie theater into a chapel. So in the 1950s and 60s, why was this exciting? Because it was air conditioned. And so many people would come to the chapel, at least according to the documents, because it was a cool place to hang out, cool and temperature-wise, right? Uh, and apparently in 1972, the South Station expanded and this chapel closed. But I found mention in uh, the Boston Globe of people who had commuted through South Station and become friends with others through the chapel actually having reunions, which I thought was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So Boston has this unique and interesting history of uh, chapels for workers. There's also one at the Prudential Center, which is still there, that Cushing played a part in. And there are a number of chapels that Cushing built. He had a huge building program. There's one at Brandeis. We've started to make a list, and we've found about 20 to 30 at least Cushing chapels, um, not always in uh, workplaces, but in a range of other places. OK, so I thought we would start at the airport, because it's interesting. And who knew that you know, we have this special uh, role? And then I thought we might go to Pedix. So you all will know this chapel, but most of the people I've spoken to don't know too much about this chapel. Uh, this was built as a non-denominational chapel in 1941, and it was one of about 500 military kit chapels be built before and during World War II. So this is a picture of uh, some of the materials that they used for the kit chapels. This chapel was used for Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish services for members of the military, and then for their families when Fort, An Fort Andrews was an active military base. It also served as a place of worship for Italian prisoners of war who were held on the island, and later for summer visitors to cottages on the island. These are a few other historical photos that I got from Jessica who can probably tell you more about them than I can. So the chapel was abandoned in the 1950s when the base was decommissioned, and it fell into disrepair. 
And it was between 2012 and 2014, and some of you probably watched this, so can tell me the story, uh, that the chapel was fully renovated by the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation and the Boston Harbor Alliance with support from the New England Union Carpenters Training Program and the Amelia Peabody Charitable Foundation. So this is in the midst of renovation. You can see they've taken down a lot of the old paint. And this is what the inside of the chapel looks like today. So in this renovation, there was significant structural work done. The pews were removed. A lighting and a sound system was sort of um, reinvigorated. There was painting and landscape work. Windows, doors, and hanging lights were installed, interestingly, from an identical kit chapel that was at the Naval Air Station in South Weymouth that was being demolished. So they brought things from that chapel to put into this chapel so that they would be uh, authentic. The original chapel had a government-issued pipe organ that was not replaced in the renovation. So today, you know, you can see this chapel from Hull, and my understanding is that it's available for different kinds of services. Uh, it was really a treat to get to go and look inside, so I'm going to you know, put this trip and try to get some of my friends to go who have wanted to be able to go and see the inside. Okay, so that's Pedix. Um, I thought we then might go to some places that are possibly more uh, sort of known to people, which are chapels and hospitals. Okay, um, so I thought we might go first to Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Boston, which is interesting because Beth Israel Deaconess was created in 1996 when Beth Israel, the Jewish hospital, merged with New England Deaconess Hospital, which was a Methodist hospital. Each chapel had their each hospital had their own chapel, and when they merged, I mean, who wants to close a chapel? So they kept both of the chapels. And they have really interesting and different stories. So on the Jewish side, the Wolfson Chapel was at Beth Israel. This is a historical picture of that chapel. This was a very Jewish space with a bima, with a place to hold the Torah scrolls and sacred texts. And this chapel, a few years ago, after the merger, was renovated to be more of an interfaith space. So today it looks like this. And the goal here was to support families from a range of religious and spiritual backgrounds. And you can sort of see here that there were some stained glass windows that they kept in the renovation. Um, and they left plaques designated some of the early supporters. But they also added to the space a tabernacle to hold communion for Catholics who were looking for communion. There's a cabinet you can't see in this picture for prayer rugs as well as a sign pointing towards Mecca. That was on what was the Jewish side. On what was the Methodist side, uh, is the Andrew, uh, sorry, Arthur Dooley Chapel that was built in 1956 at what was then Deaconess Hospital. So when it was built, and these are some pictures, when we went to take pictures of this chapel, the chaplain told us that they were thinking about renovating it, and they found up in the attic of the chapel an old scrapbook. And in the scrapbook, someone had kept all of the photos of the chapel as it was being built. That's where this picture came from, as well as cards and newspaper clippings. I mean, it was this amazing resource. And she said, do you want to see it? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so um, we found these pictures there. They were not labeled, so we're guessing. But I mean, this seems like they were putting the steeple on the chapel. Because if you're going down the Jamaica Way towards Jamaica Plain, and Beth Israel is on your left, this chapel looks like a little tiny church stuck to the side of the hospital. I grew up in a Methodist church, and this looks like a mini version of the church that I grew up in. So I assume that this is when they were putting the steeple on. I think this is the handing over of the key, seems likely. And this is what the chapel looks like today. So if you're driving down the Jamaica Way, uh, that's what it looks like from the outside. And this is what it looks like from the inside. So. The, it continues to have its original stained glass windows, an altar, an organ. They did take a few pews out of the back few rows in recent years because they wanted to create floor space so that Muslims would have a place to pray. And there are actually quite a number of Muslim staff in the Longwood Medical Area, and so they also have different gatherings and materials there for, for that group of people. Okay, so one more and then uh, we're gonna talk. So this last example is one of my favorites. This is the New England Seafarers Mission, which is in the building adjacent to the cruise port in Boston on Black Falcon Ave. So anybody who's ever gone on a cruise from Boston, this building is right next to where you get on your cruise ship. 
but I, you would never know that it had any religious connotation. The first time I went down there, I had no idea where I was going, and I was looking to park, and there was a police officer, so I stopped, and I said, I'm looking for the New England Seafair, and he looked at me, he said, the mission? And I was like, yeah, I guess. He said, it's right there. And I would have never known, it's a tall building. Um, and so this organization has a really interesting history. It was founded for seamen and immigrants in 1881 as the Scandinavian Seamen's Mission. It's gone through a whole lot of transitions and transformations that I've written a paper about, if anybody cares. But today, it basically serves cruise ship staff, port workers, and seafarers on container ships. So what does this mean? This organization is supported by the Covenant Churches, and the mission here offers a small chapel, which I'm going to show you in a second, alongside free internet access, a MoneyGram facility, and a small store stocked with toiletries, candies, and treats from around the world. Bibles in multiple languages fill the shelves next to brochures about safety and the rights of seafarers. This facility is busiest, busiest from May to October because that's the cruise port season, right? Ships go from Boston to Bermuda. They go up the eastern seaboard so people can see the leaves changing. And when a ship comes into harbor, typically the crew has about 12 hours while they do people, you know, one group gets off and the other group gets on. And so you now, if you're a seafarer, and most of these seafarers are from parts of the developing world, you can be paid electronically, but if you want to send some of that money to your partner and some to your child and some to your mother, the companies won't let you do that. And so these seafarers come into the MoneyGram facility with their checks, their electronic checks, and they can designate where they want the money to go. And then um, Steve Cushing, who runs this, very intentionally gathers snacks from the Philippines and other places to try to have some kinds of comfort food um, because this is a really hard life, right? These people are away from home for a very long time. Also, when it's not cruise port season, Steve and some of the other chaplains go on board the container ships. So all, you know, 90% of our consumer goods, and we could all look at the tags in our shirts and try to figure out where this furniture was made, almost all comes into to Boston and to most of New England through the port of Boston on big container ships. It's then, some of it even goes as far as Chicago, but every week there are container ships coming in carrying consumer goods, um, crude oil, the, plane, the gas that runs the planes actually goes underground from the port underneath the water directly to Logan. And so when a ship comes in, the Coast Guard cares for the vessel, Customs cares for the goods, but the only people that care for the people on the ships, if anyone, are these port chaplains. Some of these men are able to get off the ship but none of them, or almost none of them, are American citizens. And you have to have a visa to get off the ship. It depends on uh, wh where you're from and whether your employer will pay for your visa. So it's not uncommon to have men who were detained on these ships for nine months because they actually don't have the visas to get off. So the port chaplains go out and they bring them newspapers from Boston, they bring them hats, they bring them toothbrushes. Um, and the ones who can get off, where do they want to go? They want to go to Best Buy. And so they take them to Best Buy, they spend a lot of time going back and forth to the Cambridge Side Galleria Mall, and they provide free transportation because, again, these folks are not making a lot of money. And the last thing you want them to have to do, I would not want them to have to do when they arrive in Boston, is pay a big taxi fee to get to the Cambridge Side Galleria. So let me show you a few more pictures of the space. This is their little chapel. It's up on the third floor. Um, and I asked Steve Cushing, does anybody ever use this space? And he said, well, sometimes someone goes in there to make a private cell phone call. And he has a bendable screen that he puts up here uh, so people can have a little privacy. Yeah, I've got a bunch more pictures of this um, on our website that I can show you. So I can stand here and tell you stories all night, but I thought that I would just show you the website. And then if there are particular places you want to see the pictures of or stories you want me to tell you, I'd be really happy to do that. Let's see if we can get back to it. Um, we gave, and uh, Randy's not here, so I can tell you this. Randy is a fabulous photographer. And we gave free copies of all of these pictures to uh, all of the organizations that let us in. And we, asked, we you know, told them to use them for whatever they wanted. All of these pictures are freely available on the web, and we encourage people to download them to be your screensaver or whatever you want, because I think they're pretty special images. <clears throat> um, much of the story that I just told you is here under the introduction tab. And then we've got all the different spaces we found organized by sector. So um, you can look at you know, any of the ones that you want. Mass, the Massachusetts Correctional Institutions actually gave us access to three prisons, Framingham, Norfolk, and Concord. And I can show you those if you want to see the corrections facilities. We tried to get into the um, more local prisons and jails, and they didn't think this was really a very good idea. Um, 
But tell me what you want to see or what questions I can answer. Tell me what we've missed. I really want to hear what you're thinking about this. Which one? Corrections facilities. Okay. Yep. So part of what was interesting to me about correctional facilities is that once you get inside the chapel or meditation or prayer spaces, you often would have no idea that you were in a prison. And this was interesting to me also about the Catholic spaces. If you just drop me in one of these Catholic chapels, I couldn't tell you if I was in the airport or the port or the prison which I think tells us something about how religious space looks and how it works. Let's see. Um, so this, it, it's been very hard to figure out the history of the prison, of the um, chapels at the Concord prison. This whole inside square that you're looking at are the chapels and they're sort of half sunk into the ground. So you walk into the prison, you go through the security, poor Randy had to take every little piece of his camera apart. Um, and then you walk up to the steps and you go down the steps. There we go. So you walk down the steps here, you can see them, right? To go into this building. Um, this is the Muslim prayer space. So you, the light part here is actually one of those sticky uppy things that you saw from the outside, one of those tower looking things. These were some pamphlets available outside. Uh, this is the Catholic chapel in the prison at Concord. Um, this, interestingly, we think is a confessional booth, but of course you can't have a closed space in a prison, right? So it's really only sort of half of a confessional booth. Mm -hmm. A lot of images of Mother Teresa in all of the prisons, um, which I think tells us something, tells us quite a lot actually. This was the altar getting a bit closer in the Catholic chapel, Stations of the Cross on the wall, and then looking up into one of those tall towers. Uh, this is the Protestant chapel. Again, looking up into one of the tall towers. Yep, so that's Concord. Um, we are pretty sure that of all the spaces that we visited, it's the prison chapels that get the most use. And you'll be able to see here at Norfolk, they have a sign of all the different gatherings in the chapels, and there are multiple events there every day. So here at um, Norfolk, this is the Protestant space. Um, that's the list of all the different uh, services. Uh, there's a small synagogue in Norfolk, which we were just fascinated by. Randy thought it was funny that the bathroom was right there. Uh, the biggest gathering at the Norfolk prison f through the chaplains is actually um, Christmas Eve or Christmas Day Mass, and they hold it in the auditorium. So this is a picture of the auditorium to give us a sense of the size. And then interestingly, at Norfolk, they have tried to accommodate prisoners who do practices in the Native American tradition. So this is actually the framework of a Native American sweat lodge. And under particular conditions with particular support, they do ceremonies in the sweat lodge. So when you do a ceremony in the sweat lodge, a big animal skin goes over the top. And basically, you make a fire in this pit in the middle. And it gets very, very hot. And then people go in there and they do particular rituals. Um, so the, the folks that showed us around in Norfolk were pretty proud of this. Um, it was outside next to some gardens where they grow a lot of food that they eat and use for different purposes. And then there were these trees that had these signs on them. So you can see love, truth, I think that one said transition, yep. And then the last one I'll show you here is um, Framingham. So Framingham, there are two women's prisons in Massachusetts. One is in Framingham and the other one is further west. And Framingham, if I remember correctly, has both county and state prisoners. Um, it has two chapels. It has a small chapel on the first floor and quite a large chapel upstairs. So I'll give you a sense of both of these. Um, the upstairs chapel has been there for a long time. And again, we're still trying to track down the history of this. But uh, we found some documentation that suggests that during the Work Progress Administration, some artists actually designed what at the time were quite famous murals in this chapel. They've since been painted over, but this space has quite a history that we're trying to work out. And you can see that the pews are labeled because uh, women in different units have to sit in different places. There's Mother Teresa. 
This is looking back, and these stained glass windows actually have a particular story that, again, I was contacted the other day, or I, I was able to make contact with the woman who's an expert in stained glass in Boston. And I said, you need to look at all these windows and tell me, tell me about them, and we'll put it on the website. So she's taking a peek at them. I don't have the story yet. There they are, closer up. Um, these are the choir robes. There's a, a church choir that sings in this, in this space. And then this is the downstairs chapel. It's much smaller and used for different kinds of gatherings during the week. Yep, so those are some of the correctional facilities. Um, you know, we can also ask some questions about what makes a space sacred and how has that changed over time? And part of what we see in some of these spaces is a movement from chapels that looked like they were specifically Catholic or specifically Protestant to trying to create spaces that make room for people from a range of different religious traditions. And the places that we most see this transition happening are in colleges and universities. And the best example is at Northeastern. So Northeastern historically had a very Protestant Gothic chapel. It actually burned down in the 1990s, and with the insurance money, they decided to build a really different kind of space. I'm gonna show you the pictures, but they call it the sacred space. And their idea is to create a space where all of, all of the students, regardless of their background or having had no background, might come and just find some respite. So to give you a sense of that, let's look at Northeastern. This is a space also that was designed with a prominent architect. I mean, these spaces are all different in terms of how much time and attention and money was put into them. So this is, it's called the Center for Spirituality, Dialogue, and Service. And this is their sacred space. And it's designed, again, to bring in different items that you might need for a ritual or a gathering there. We set it up because there were meditation cushions around to try to make it look like something was happening. And then in the corner, it's interesting, when they designed the space, they created a separate area for Muslims to pray, but traditional, traditionally women and men don't pray together. And so the women actually kind of carved this area out of the side of the sacred space so that they could have a prayer area. This is the washing area Muslims traditionally wash before they pray. And then behind this blue curtain is actually where the men pray. So this is what it looks like behind the blue curtain. So that's kind of interesting. And the only thing that remains from the original chapel that burned down is that stained glass window. So they kept one stained glass window to be indicative of their history. And they also created a study room uh, just with the idea that there are multiple things that happen in these spaces. So what else can I tell you? What, what else are you thinking about? Who maintains? It depends on the site. I mean, so about half of them, maybe half of them are open to the public. The other half are not. Um, sometimes there are chaplains that maintain them. Some of them are not maintained very much at all. So Government Center, many of you probably know Government Center, uh, is a very famous building architecturally in Boston. It has a chapel that we were able to get access to. It's not open to the public. It leaks. And in order to take the pictures, we hid um, the trash can that was collecting the dripping water. Let's see if I can find it. Mm, I think it's here. Here it is. Um, so this was, still has a piece that's a, um, a mental health facility. The, the patients were actually moved to a different location. So there used to be chaplains who maintained this space, but the chaplains have since relocated. So this is a space that's not open to the public. Um, this is not one of my favorite spaces, but the architects, often architects adore it because it's architecturally very, very interesting, made from poured concrete, as you can see. I'm giving away the secrets and telling you that the trash can is hiding behind the altar. But also when this space was designed, because it was a place that had some people that may, might need to be sort of separated, you can come in on the bottom, but there's also a balcony on the top, and you can't get from one level to the other inside the chapel. You have to go outside and walk up around through the building. Um, but this is a space that nobody's maintaining. This is the area where the priests or the ministers change their clothes up on the side. Yeah. What else? Why aren't they maintaining it? Um, I think that they're not sure what to do with it. 
I mean, we'd have to ask to get the official answer, but my sense is that there are occasional services. There are, uh, is a facility for people who are homeless to stay at government center. And my understanding, and I might be getting the details wrong, is that there are sometimes people, leaders, staff there who hold services in the space. Um, but architecturally, this building has had all kinds of problems, and it's very expensive to maintain. So I, I suspect that that's the reason why, but um, I may have gotten that wrong. Yeah, it depends on the place. Okay. I mean, Harvard Business School, they take care of their chapel very well. Uh, most of the colleges and universities are responsible for their own upkeep. Um, some of the spaces have really fallen into disrepair. It, it just completely depends on the institution. Yeah. Do most hospitals have multi-page chapels? So I came to do this project because I wrote a book called Paging God about religion in hospitals. And I spent way more time than the average person sitting in hospital chapels. And my sense is that over time, hospitals across the country have moved from having tradition-specific chapels to having multi-faith chapels. I think that's the way things are going. Um, I could give you a whole bunch of examples, but Children's Hospital is the best example. So they used to have a pretty Protestant chapel. Then they wanted to open it up, so they actually created a pulley system at the front of the chapel uh, where you could pull in a cross, a cross with Jesus on it, a Star of David, depending on who was using the chapel. Um, and now they may still have those symbols, but they've now added many more symbols. So there's definitely been a movement towards multi-faith spaces. The question that I always ask is, are they used, right? Are these multi-faith spaces comfortable and familiar to people, or are people not sure what they are and what they're for? And I get pretty regularly calls from hospitals, usually, that are looking to renovate their chapel, asking me, you know, what they should do. And the first question I always ask is, well, who's your staff? Who are your patients? You know, what do people need? because I don't think there's a, a cookie cutter way to do this because people's needs are so different. Yeah? I was gonna say, with all these um, institutions and, and hospitals moving towards you know, a unified space for all religions, why do you think the prisons keep them separate? Is it because they're so busy? That's a great question. So I'm trying to write a book about chaplains in Boston. And people who think about these chapels and that think about chaplains tend to think about them only in the military or only in hospitals, or only in airports. They tend not to ask questions across all chaplains. And I'm trying to think about, like, what do chaplains tell us about American religion? <coughs> so as part of doing this project, I interviewed nationally the leaders of different professional chaplaincy groups, and I asked them sort of why they do their work, like why is their work important? And the, the ways that people think about it are very different. So in the military and in prisons, people talk about this as being a First Amendment right. And the chaplains will say that they are responsible for protecting people's right to exercise their religions as they see fit. And they understand that to mean that they have to have sort of different places for people from different religious backgrounds. So the idea of having a multi-faith space, like it just doesn't make sense to them. Um, when you talk to people in hospitals, they talk about wanting to ease suffering. So there are these really different frames, which I think are part of the answer to your question. I think people who have very traditional, categorical ways of thinking about religion want to have a place for Protestants and a place for Catholics and a place for Jews. I think people that are sort of thinking more across are more comfortable trying to share space. And one of the questions I wonder about is, will this change? So American religious demographics are changing a lot. I mean, more than a third of people under the age of 30 say they have no religious affiliation. So there are these massive changes taking place that I think raise a whole lot of questions about whether these spaces will remain, what they'll look like, whether there will be people who want or need to use them, right, um, that all remain to be seen, um, but are certainly important to think about. Anything else? Is the public welcome in the Boston Seafarer? If you call Steve Cushing, he'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I can show you the rest of those pictures. The door, is it like locked? Or is no, it's not locked. Have you been to the one in Newport, Rhode Island? There's the a Seafarer's Chapel there. Oh, really? No, I haven't been to that one. Go in. No, I, I think I just pushed the wrong button. If, if you look on our website, you'll see all the pictures. And Steve Cushing, I'm not saying this is what you want to do, but he always needs volunteers um, to help um, provide services to the seafarers that are coming in. But if you just call and said you wanted to stop by, he'll talk your ear off. Um, it's really interesting. Yeah. But it's open for the people getting off the ships. 
It's, right, so the door is unlocked. I mean, if he's there, you can go in. He keeps pretty normal business hours. They have a calendar on their website. I think we're almost done since I somehow managed to turn the computer off. Um, if that, he's not there, then, then it's not open, off. exactly, yeah. But the calendar says when the ships are coming in, so those would be guaranteed times it would be open. Yeah. Okay, so I'm happy to stick around. Um, I hope you got, we had enough postcards. I have more if anybody needs another postcard. Okay, I'll get you some more. I really appreciate your having me. Thank you so much. Thank you.